but um, good morning and welcome to June. We jumped right from snow to a sweltering heat wave with a few little flowers sprinkled in there. Um, but we're really happy that you're with us here today. We are, if you pop to the next screen there, we're halfway through the year, which means we're halfway through this lineup of topics that we've planned out last year. Um, this will become even more important as we talk about um, evaluating these sessions and then thinking about next year. What what type of topics do you want to learn more about? Do you want to hear about from other employers? Um, be thinking about that. And we really want to capture all that in our evaluation. So at the end, we would appreciate your thoughts. Uh, my name is Jessica Miller, and I am the Director of Workforce Strategy with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. And you are here for Workforce Wednesday. We are so happy that you've cho chosen to join us this morning for our June Workforce Wednesday session, focusing on utilizing a culture of leadership as a tool for retention. If you're here, then you probably are very aware of the importance of effective leadership on workforce retention. And if not, buckle up because you're about to find out. We are super excited about our topic today and the guests that have chosen to spend their time with us and share their wisdom with us. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining us. If you're returning, thank you for joining us again. Our session will go today until noon, after which we'll segue into a 30-minute unplug session where we will invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself, ask questions of our panelists as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants verbally or through chat. I would also like to take a moment to Again, encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end. We'll pop that link into chat later on um, and let you know that these webinars are recorded. So if you want to revisit anything that anybody had to say this morning or maybe Della will give us a repeat uh, song of Serenade of 9 to 5 like she did earlier, you can check that out on YouTube as well as our careerforcemn.com website, where you will also find recordings and resources from this session, as well as all of our previous sessions. We will be utilizing our chat feature today throughout our time together. Please ask questions, answer questions, interact with other guests, consultants, partners, each other. We really want to build upon the community that we've started here together with each other, and we welcome your engagement. You want to pop to the next slide. Thank you. Our team of consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on their region and the employers that they serve in those regions. But the common core ways that we support our employers are listed here on this slide. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies, ensure that you're connected to your local, regional, and state workforce partners and assist you in building strategies that will help you attract and retain workforce. When you work with one of us, you're automatically connected to all of us and as well to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive. We don't do this work alone, and it takes many people to bring the success to these efforts. And finally, we want to learn more about you. Please take a second to introduce yourself into the chat if you haven't done so yet. Tell us your name, title, company, as well as um, something that you're interested in learning more about today in this session. I know that we have a packed agenda today, so we're going to dive in, and I would love to introduce you to Mr. James Whirlwind Soldier, our Northwest Workforce Strategy Consultant. James. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks everybody for coming. Like Jessica said, if you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first time, let us know. Let us know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and what you want to hear from us uh in the future and so uh just like jessica mentioned today we're talking about culture and specifically a culture of leadership as a tool for organizations when we're as workforce strategy consultants we work with talent attraction and retention a lot of the time and so let's focus on that specifically with regard to our conversation um 
if you've been here before, you know how our agenda uh, looks. It's pretty pretty straightforward. We'll start with some data, a little bit of uh, review, some studies that have been done around leadership and employee engagement and culture. Then we'll go ahead and introduce our panel of esteemed subject matter experts who we're just so happy to have here. Um, after that, we'll go ahead and enter right into our roundtable discussion um, and let that uh, percolate and move in the way it will. If questions come up during that period of time, please feel free to throw them into the chat and we'll make sure they get asked during the unplugged session. Or of course, you can take yourself off mute and turn on your camera during the unplugged session and ask those questions of your, uh, yourself. So after that roundtable discussion, uh, we'll wrap up, make a few announcements, and like I said, go into that uh, unplugged session, which starts at about noon and goes to about 1230. So let's go ahead and start talking about some of this data uh, to make sure that we feel like this is a topic that's worthy of our time uh, and our consideration as business leaders. So uh, according to Gallup, a study that was done by them, oh, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, we'll make sure and put all of the sources of this data into our slide deck. Adashe was also going to share this in the chat so that um, you can drill down deeper if you want to and explore what, what's actually being uh, said within these studies. So according to Gallup, only 30% of United States employees are engaged at work. That's an extremely low number. Uh, and within this same study by Gallup, they found that when measuring engagement, there is a 70% variance in team, uh, team engagement based on leadership. That's just how uh, much of, a, of an impact leadership has on, on us and our organizations. Gallup also found uh, within the same study links between employee engagement, higher profitability, uh, higher productivity, uh, fewer defects, fewer injuries, less uh, and less absenteeism. So again, that that sense of engagement has a lot of impact on different areas of our of our organizations. Uh, according to uh, Peregrine, I'm going to go ahead and just read this right off the slide. 75% of workers who voluntarily left the, uh, left their jobs did so because their bosses. Um, because of their bosses and not the position itself. Peregrine went on in the same study to talk about how these, these numbers haven't changed for over 20 years. So that impact of, of management is still, is still very, very great. Um, further, so the Predictive Index, another organization that does really great studies, they conducted a survey that found that uh, of the people who rated their manager poorly, 77 planned to exit their company within the year. While of those respondents that rated their manager positively, only 18% planned on leaving their organization. And we've got to remember this too, like when we're talking about retention, um, if we're replacing people, it typically costs about 33% of their annual salary. That number is different depending on where you look, but that seems to be a general consensus with regard to that. So according to Flashpoint going on, um, and again, I'm just going to read this right off the slide before we talk about it a little bit. Leadership and engagement are tied to profitability. Companies that excel in leadership development experience 2.1 times higher revenue growth and 1.8 times higher profit margins. Employee engagement scores were 21% higher in uh, double versus single digit growth companies. Um, and in their 2006 study, it's a little bit in the past, but I still think it's pretty relevant. Uh, of 23,910 business units, they compared the top and bottom quartile engagement scores. Gallup found that uh, those that uh, were in the top quartile of engagement uh, had 12% higher profitability. Uh, in addition, the same uh, study found that uh, found evidence supporting the connection between leadership and talent attraction, which is why we're here, but also uh, with organizational agility, which is our ability to change and adapt and innovate uh, as, as teams and as groups. So that's really uh, interesting, I think. And so last, before we uh, move on to talk about our, our panelists and get into the topics, um, According to workplaces.com, 50 to 70% of an employee's perception of their environment is linked to the actions and behavior of management. Uh, workplace.com went on to say that uh, only 36% of this survey, 36% of the employees surveyed felt that leadership created an empowering environment. Uh, in the same study, when they asked leadership that same question, 68% of leadership felt that they were creating an empowering environment. So there is a, a bit of a discrepancy there that I think is important to, to mention. Uh, in the same study, they found that when leaders can engage workers with the organization and engage workers with other employees and create engagement with the employees' goals themselves, 
um, they found there's a 250% greater chance that an employee will be a promoter of the business, a 405% greater chance that an employee will have a great employee experience, an 845% greater chance that an employee will be engaged. I'm going to share all this with you too. So, and uh, Adashay was doing that right now. So, I don't feel like you have to remember all these numbers. Uh, a 1,674% greater chance that an employee will have a strong positive perception of the organization and a 56 percent reduction in employee turnout so again we see over and over again that a culture of leadership and leadership in general uh, can activate employees in an engaging way and, and lead to these really great uh, turnouts within the organization so but let's not take uh, these studies words for it let's talk to people that are on the ground right now doing the work and uh, providing us with some great uh, examples and so i'd like to introduce uh, our panelists and then give them each about, you know, a couple minutes, two minutes to just talk about who they are, talk about their resume and why this topic is so passionate for them. Uh, so I'd like to start with Paula Chapelis. Paula, it's so great to have you here. Uh, Paula is a certified leadership coach, a whole person certified coach and the founder of IANA Coaching. She's also the director of Blue Ox Academy. Uh, Paula, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me here and I am excited to chat about this topic. It's been on my agenda for probably 30 years, which kind of ages me a little bit. But um, So I am the founder of IANA Coaching and a professional certified coach and spend a lot of time in leadership development. Uh, through IANA Coaching, the business that I have, I contract with the Brainerd Lakes Chamber to run their Blue Ox Business Academy, which is leadership development and business education. I also uh, contract with the Initiative Foundation to run an executive director roundtable for nonprofit executive directors. I coach some of the vibrant and equitable communities program. I have a private practice where I do a lot of work with leaders um, in that intersection of life and leadership, mental health. And in addition to that, I also work for a company called Lyra out of California, L-Y-R-A, that does mental health coaching and therapy, and I do mental health coaching with them. So this intersection of leadership and mental health is just in my world. It's moving around and it's shaking, and I'm, I'm seeing all kinds of different reasons why it's so important for leaders to have some language around mental health and and not just language, but an understanding of how it's important in their role to be able to, to hear their employees and to talk to their employees. And through that, with all of those awesome statistics you had, James, I'm like, ooh, I need to copy those. <laughs> um, you know, what, what's amazing is that you're absolutely right. People leave their job because of their boss, typically. And so if I can do any kind of work to help those leaders be better leaders, know themselves better, um, be able to take care of themselves so that they can take care of their team, that that's gold. So thanks for having me. Oh, we were so happy to have you here. Uh, next, let's go to uh, Jennifer Aranda. Jennifer, it's so nice to have you here. Jennifer is the Assistant Professor of Leadership and Civic Engagement uh, for the University of Minnesota Extension Center for Community Vitality. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to take a few minutes and just uh, introduce yourself? You might be having a few technical problems here. That happens. Um, Let's go ahead and we'll come back to you, Jennifer, no problem. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump to our next panelist, uh, Shanae Burgess. Shanae is the ex Executive Leadership Coach and Director of Learning and Development for Lexington Manufacturing, LLC. Um, Shanae, before I turn the mic over to you, uh, you mentioned to me that you're cooking up something special. Is now the right time to talk about that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you 
Thanks everybody for just joining us. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic is in my role as uh, overseeing learning and development at Lexington Manufacturing, I've really got to learn the impact that growing your leaders has. And like I mentioned before, if 75% of your employees are leaving for their manager, let's focus on making those managers really great and really strong and giving them the resources. So in my, I've been with Lexington Manufacturing for four years over seeing the learning and development. And through that, I've I've grown some programs and I've seen the impact. And now I am just, I'm eager and excited to share it with others. So I'm actually launching a business called The Simple Approach, which is going to be a resource for other employers. That's uh, where, how do you get started? What are the things that are available? And what are some small nuggets that you can get going that cost you nothing to make an impact? So I'm really excited to be working on this and launching um, just to make, uh, again, more resources Resources to make it easier because there's so much potential out there. We just have to let people know that they have potential to be great. So very excited about that. Thanks, Shanae. It's so great to have you here. Uh, I think it's going to be a real great conversation. Um, let's move next to Philomena Sater. Uh, Philomena, again, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, Philomena is the, excuse me, Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Strategic Partners with Lambda Lakes Incorporated. She's also an adjunct professor of leading organizational change for St. Catharines University uh, MAOL program. Philomena, it is an <laughs> honor to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. So glad to be here. I am located in the Twin Cities, but as I saw the backgrounds of some of my partners up up north, I'm like, oh, I love the lakes and everything. So glad that you're all here today. Just a little bit of background about me. I lead our diversity, equity, and inclusion work at Landa Lakes. I'll be celebrating year six in uh, this month. So it's gone snap like that really fast. Prior to Landa Lakes, I'd been in banking. So 29 years at Wells Fargo, 29, also nine different jobs within HR, kind of midway through before diversity, equity, and inclusion was a field, I got into it through a community outreach role, which, which would later turn into a diversity consultant. Uh, and then hopped off that stagecoach when our youngest of three graduated high school. Um, I've also been super involved in the community. And so I love to see like all the different organizations that are participating. And I often talk about that at Landa Lakes with our leaders is that importance of that, outs you know, when we think about leadership, that outside in perspective. It's easy, right, to get insulated within our organization and forget about what's happening in our communities and our world and the impact that has on our employees. So, uh, and then St. Kate's, I'm on hiatus right now, James, because they moved my class to virtual only. And I'm an in-person lady from because it's 6 to 9 p.m. <laughs> and after working on the computer, you know, during the day, I'm like, I'm not I'm not your person in person. I can rise to the occasion, but uh, via Zoom. Mm -mm. So uh, hopefully they'll come back to maybe even a hybrid position for that. So there is something magical that happens with in person. Uh, right. De Della Ludwig and I, my colleague from the central region, did a consultation we were uh, talking about just how how uh, different the conversations go when we're face to face versus over over teams or zoom. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the community, your community work, because that leads right back to uh, our friend Jen Aranda. Jen, I'm sorry about the, the technical difficulties. That was my fault. Um, but Jen, let's uh, get an introduction from her. Jen is the Assistant Professor of Leadership and Civic Engagement for the University of Minnesota Extension Center for Community Vitality which plays exactly into what we were just talking about uh, with you, Philomena. So, uh, Jen, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, do you mind taking a few minutes and introducing yourself? No, I'm honored. Thanks for having me here, James. And wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, as James said, I work for a University of Minnesota Extension, and I'm an educator in leadership and civic engagement. So as Philomena said, you know, I work with community and my background is in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Philomena, you know, those words are always changing, right? It used to just be diversity, and now we have belonging, and so I've worked, I'm a seasoned, none of us are older, I'm a seasoned professional, 
And some of my background is in community organization. I've had my own business. I've worked in corporate and lately I've worked in academia. So it's been interesting to be in administration and then also on the student affairs and really face to face side with students. Um, for me, you know, that's that's the job I get paid for. I always feel that um, as a black woman and I will say that I'm speaking as a black woman and I'm looking at retention and leadership within the, the lens of race and equity. For me, I know that I'm standing on the shoulders of my ancestors and I'm, I'm really tasked with being a mentor and tasked with supporting change wherever we can. And that includes retention. And as folks said, you know, retention is not just retaining. It's also looking and growing what you have within your teams and within your organization. Because those staggering statistics that James shared, they're real. I have left positions because of a supervisor. I loved my work. But if I'm not allowed to do my work, if there isn't the recognition of being that leader within your work and having leaders look and say, yes, you are important. They lose out on, on the institutional knowledge that your employees have gained. Those KSAs that can't be replaced because they can't be measured. So I'm I'm ecstatic to be here. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think this is a great opportunity to just go right into our panel discussion with you, Jen, if that's okay. Because um, I think you've just inspired a question uh, for me. Um, so in previous conversations, Jen, I'm going to try to quote you here. Um, we were talking, I think we were talking about Robert's rules of order and just about how it can be kind of uh, intimidating to have to kind of navigate through those spaces. And what you said was um, there's value that comes from underrepresented people learning to navigate the professional and decision making spaces. And I think this applies to what you said about growing what you have and that retention. Uh, by developing leaders, um, but also you talked about just a few minutes ago, you referenced institutions also, and which is what we're kind of referring to, right? Can you uh, maybe explain what you meant by that and elaborate a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I don't know if folks know earlier this year, uh, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, the Crown Act was passed. We're not talking about minor details. We are talking about folks' lives and, and what and who they are and who they bring into the workplace. And I know that we'll talk about code switching later, just all of the, the navigation in professional spaces is very different depending on your culture, depending on how you have been brought up, depending, you know, we know Minnesota has its own culture. Just as when I was in South Dakota, it did. When I was in New York, it did. Very different. And so learning the language that's being spoken and even the unspoken languages. You know, what about that daily work experience? We don't all have the lived experience that's the same. Again, moving back into being an underrepresented person, microaggressions daily, colorism, being kept from the table. So how do we navigate those, those instances of having to pay emotional labor and tax and balance that with being able to find a mentor, being able to find an advocate, being able to grow in those spaces? We love so, the, Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, please go ahead. So we, we have that confirmation bias, right? We love um, to know what's going to happen. And with that, we love to have identical people. We love to yeah. see ourselves represented. And yes. so that's where that leadership starts. Yes, and helping them navigate those spaces. Yes. Yeah. So you talked about, like, so we're talking about stressors, right? Trying to like live in two worlds. Right, yes. kind of ad adhere to or are conformed to uh, professional culture as it exists within mainstream business today. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to jump over to you, Paula. 
because these experiences, right, code switching, just like uh, Adeshewa communicated to us so eloquently a few months ago, um, these can be big stressors and they can actually be barriers to, to individuals going for higher positions, right? That, in, that need to uh, conform or code switch or what have you. Um, you talk a lot about mental wellness, right? This is a passion for you and emotional wellness, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, how can you be a little more elaborate about how that intersection plays in with leadership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you were talking, Jen, I was thinking about some of the work that I do through Lyra. So work with people all throughout the United States that are in different positions. And I remember this one person talking about, she was Asian, talking about how she was asked to present herself in this role so that she could be promoted. And she was asking, asked to do and behave in a way that was not really part of what her culture represented. And so, talk about that stress, right, of, well, this is what I was taught growing up, but this is what they're telling me I need to do in order to grow. And by the way, I don't see anybody with an Asian background in any leadership roles. So I don't, I don't know how this works. And so this idea of the stress, there's so many different areas where leaders and not even just leaders, but our employees are stressed out. And, you know, one of the things that um, as a resource that I find helpful, there's a uh, state of the workforce, state of the mental health workforce report by Lyra, and you can find it on lyrahealth.com. And they talk about like, what are, there was a report they did last year in 2022 and, um, they surveyed like 2,500 employees, 250 employee benefit leaders at companies. And some of the insights that they got, I just want to share them with you because I think it shows how important the ability to talk about mental health and stress on our employees, what it does for an organization. So the first insight was most workers face mental health struggles, but for a myriad of reasons, many don't get help. Uh, too many employees struggle to get the right care. That's huge. And that's actually why Lyra started in the first place. Is it's very, very difficult to find a therapist, um, to even think about going to therapy, and then maybe not even being able to get in for months and months at a time. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons Lyra started bringing in this idea of having coaches work on mental health with people and it's exploded and they've been a pioneer in this area and Philomena I think you said that Landa Lakes is a customer of Lyra as well and so you know um, the third one is many people are discussing mental health at work so it's propelling a cultural shift um, managers lack needed mental health resources I don't know how to talk about it. If a leader finds their own struggle and, and aren't sure how to talk about mental health for themselves, how are they going to do that with their employees who we know are dealing with a lot of different issues? Um, and then the fifth one, employees are increasingly stressed and burned out, signaling a need for better work design. So absolutely, it's it's so integrated and you know we talk about imposter syndrome with leaders we talk about managing stress we talk about boundaries we talk about how to have those really difficult conversations with your either colleagues or team members or whatever it might be and so there's a lot of opportunity for growth within leaders and yeah, so I'll just stop there because I could keep well, that's, going. <laughs> that's great. I mean, so we've talked about, uh, and again, this is a, co a topic that Adeshiwa covered so well, but I still want to bring it back up again, especially with regard to leadership and what Jen mentioned about uh, allowing minoritized individuals to get access into those roles or spaces that maybe were, uh, they don't know how to navigate. Um, and I want to open this to, to everybody in the panel. 
this I think this makes uh, complete sense for everybody to, to, to chime in on. But there have been studies of people who code switch saying that they're not going to stop. I think like it's like 80 percent of people who code switch say it serves me very, very well. I'm not going to stop. It's I'm getting raises and promotions and special projects. Um, so this is a question for both you, Paul and Jen and, and of, of course, Shanae and Philomena. But uh, what do we do in those circumstances? I mean, we know that code switching isn't a good thing. But we still see people uh, applying it to uh, gain better opportunities for promotion and leadership roles. What do you say to that? It's a hard one. First, Jen, or do you want to go? <laughs> How long do you have again? Um, <laughs> So I'm not going to get into for those who don't know, um, code switching involves adjusting who you are to. The comfort of others. And and in exchange for that, you know, this is Harvard speaking in exchange for that, you get like fair treatment, quality service, employment opportunities, just like James was saying. There is nothing wrong with code switching. Code switching is about um, you've learned. That's the language of the oppressor. How else are you going to get going? Yeah. I think a, a better question for me has been not good or bad, but let's look at the foundations of why we code switch. You know, who are we making comfortable? And, and what are the systems in place that require you to be palatable to get anywhere? Those are the questions that that I would love to explore because it's it's going to happen. Those are the systems in place. And to to piggyback on that, you know, working with the individuals that are experiencing this. Um, I, often what happens is, you know, we go back to. What it is that they value. What are their values? What's important to them? What are they? What are their goals? Like where do they want to go? Um, how do they embody those values in a way that they can feel good about? You know, and the value might be that they just need they need financial security. They need security. And so, you know, it's it's helping them understand. Um, you know, in the coaching that I do is helping them understand what what they're comfortable with, how they can align with their own values and really get into that piece for them or with them and actually more in partnership with them. So. Beautiful. Um, let's move on to a question for Philomena, and this will be another one. I think people I mean, again, everybody can just chime in. I just make this a great conversation. Yeah. But Philomena, as I was LinkedIn stalking you, <laughs> I saw a quote on your page, uh, and this is a quote from Angelican Bishop and human rights advocate and Nobel Prize winner Desmond Tutu. And I think yeah. this is a really great quote. I've never heard it before, and it was really inspiring. Um, <laughs> Do your little bits of good where you are. It's these little bits of good put together that can overwhelm the world. Uh, what does this mean, and how does it relate to leadership? Yeah, that's great. So just a little bit of background first, James, and our, to our team here. I'm a quote lady. I think it comes from my Irish heritage. So my mom is an Irish immigrant and all those Irish poets and authors, right? And I've always been drawn to quotes to inspire, right, and support. I have quotes all over our house and our kids growing up were like, what's up with mom? But now I think as young adults, they're like, I like this. <laughs> But with that particular quote, and I'll tie it into leadership, it's those small things, right? It's like I'm on a Zoom call and I'm paying attention to what's happening, right? I walk down the hall at Land Lakes. I'm here today. I ask uh, Shanae, how are you doing? And I stop and I listen, right? So a lot of times we think it has to be so grand that we forget those like little moments that are so important to people. I also pay attention to, you know, what might be happening with my employees personally. 
and following up with them to just say, hey, how's your son doing now? You know, like those moments, because I think, you know, now that our work is so integrated between work and life, there's that intersection. And, and Paula talked a lot about that, right? So that piece. And then my last thing I'll say is during COVID, I was like, what could I do that could be like that little moment, right? That Desmond talks about. So I became the chocolate lady. So I have a little bag of chocolates in my purse. And when retail, restaurants, male person, I leave the little chocolate and it's like, I look at them, I thank them. And if they have their name on their name tag, I'm like, hey, Shayla, thank you so much. And I will tell you, this is really interesting. I've had people cry. I see you, you're not invisible. I've had people dance, sing. I mean, it's been amazing. So I'm just gonna encourage you to get your chocolates, Lint chocolates and dear deli are people's faves. I'm just saying. <laughs> so there you have it, James. It's not always about the money, right? Exactly. And and we're talking about culture again. You're creating that that engagement, that uh, great opportunity. Um, this relates to a conversation that you and I had, Sh Shanae. Uh, Jen, I really want to get, use the word palatable a couple of minutes ago, Jen, and I want to touch base on that. Hopefully, at some point, maybe in a, pre a future conversation. But Shanae, again, on this point, piece of engagement. Um, you talked to me when we spoke about uh, su a succession plan that you had developed with some of your employees. And I think this is especially interesting because um, the labor market analyst for the Northwest, Anthony Schaffhauser, talks often about uh, a lack of people returning to work after retirement and that that number is, is high enough to where it's actually impacting our, our workforce participation numbers in, in a, a relatively negative way. Um, and we know that these people are returning, um, getting back to what Philomena mentioned, they're not coming back necessarily for the money. There's something else about employment that appeals to them. Um, when we are having this conversation, we talked about those statistics, right? And you said, well, we're not really seeing that at Lexington um, because we're doing this, we have this engagement succession plan uh, with people that are coming up to retirement. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of my most favorite conversations to have because it's as as people are getting ready to retire, there's a lot of emotions that they're having, right? They're like, I don't really want to, I don't know if I want to, maybe part time. And the manager is like, I can't ask them when they're leaving, right? So it's just like, how do you balance such a delicate conversation? So I usually ask them like, all right, let me in on this one. I got it. Um, so from an organization standpoint, we looked at, okay, what's our average retirement? retirement age. And we didn't know that. So we looked at the last 10 years and we're really digging into like, okay, what is the average and how many do we have that's coming into retirement in the next three to five years? We have 30 that are coming up. And that's critical. We have 300 employees. So 30 employees that have tenure here, it like that's a, a that could be a huge impact on us as an organization. So I, I thought about this idea as we do this, these individual development plans, we kind of work with everyone individually. What do you want? And a lot of times I'd see theirs come through and they'd say to retire. And I'd be like, that's all you want in the next three to five years? What? And then you start diving in. And I said, as an organization, what can we do to help you prepare for retirement? And a lot of times as you're asking those questions, they're like, well, you know, I'm not really sure how the, the benefits work when I hit 65. I'm not really sure about my 401k. What do I do? And I said, what if we brought those resources to you here at work and you we create this plan and then every year until your retirement, they're, they're going to come in and check in on you and make sure that you you have your plan. And they're like, yeah, they're excited. Right. And I said, in return. How do you feel about helping us as an organization, creating a plan for all your knowledge? How can we make sure that we get someone up to speed of where you're at? And so they have the excitement of we're helping them. And then in return, they say, of course, I want to be part of that because now they're not as afraid. You know, a lot of times they have that feeling of, well, if I'm not doing it and no one is good at good as I am, then I'd like I failed, you know, so it's bridging this gap of like they're so excited to have this person come in, learn what they know and then see them being able to do it without their help. And a lot of times they're like, I, I'm not going to work part time. I'm, I'm ready. I'm done. I'm going to stick to the stakes. I have a plan. And yeah. it's really a beautiful art to just see it come together of like so much confidence coming from them and then security for us to know that they're not, you know, Sure, they might decide to leave early, and that's that's okay. We accept, we we want that for them. But making sure that as an employer, we're supporting them where they're at, um, at every stage. 
That's great. And then you're, it's almost like you're creating a legacy for them, right? I think that's what we talked about too, where they, they get really passionate about that. Um, and again, that's one of those pieces of engagement that's that's different. That's that piece of chocolate. It's not the- It is, yes, absolutely. And you'll see them creating their own little sheets of like, oh, so I, I made this document and they can't wait to share it. And I was like, people are so excited to share what they know. We just have to give them an opportunity to do it. Yeah. And that's where the engagement just goes out of the world because it's really cool to see the engagement just soaring. Do you think that's new? Do you think that that engagement would have lived, would have existed decades ago had we put the systems in place to support it? Great, great question. I think as humans, my personal belief is as humans, we want to share. And I just didn't know, maybe we just didn't know we could. It was, this is how we do it. This is how we always have done it. And now we're saying, well, what if we don't do it that way? What else does that look like? Let's collaborate and let's work as a team. And so I, I think maybe we always could have or would have if we would have known that it was okay. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of another conversation. Uh, excuse me, Paula. We talked about, again, that intersection of wellness and leadership. Uh, and I've had plenty of conversations about the priority of wellness as a as a benefit to an organization and to its its talent base, um, but that seems relatively new to me too. Like it seems to me that organizations haven't always been as focused on wellness. So uh, we didn't really talk about this beforehand. So I might be throwing you a curveball here. But where did that come from, and why is it prioritized by leadership now? I mean, above and beyond what what Jen talked about and you talked about regarding the stressors of, of having to comply to an, uh, a different culture? Well, a couple things I'm thinking more recently, like what we just went through in the last three years is kind of the <laughs> elephant in the room when it comes to mental health. Major, major shifts in how employees work, um, what they want for their lives, um, how they want to have work as a place in their life, not necessarily life as a place in their work. I also think that our younger generations are more comfortable talking about mental health and mental wellness. And that has inspired or maybe pushed <laughs> the rest of us to have those conversations. And so we are definitely, I think, noticing the shift culturally and with other things that have happened in the last three years in our country, especially in Minnesota, yeah. there's there's a need, huge need for us to be able to have this kind of conversation at work because people are suffering. People are really suffering. And um, so, you know, I think as employers, it's important to really gauge the mental wellness of your 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 employees, yeah. and and not only for them, but to have the resources for their loved ones. So, you know, an employee might not be experiencing mental health themselves, but they might have a teenager who is, or a spouse who is, and so it's really this this world of mental health uh, resources, it can be really difficult to navigate and there's stigma along with it and there's all these challenges with it and people are exhausted in their work and at home and all the rest of it. Yeah. So if organizations are looking to grow and are looking for this shift to happen, I think mental wellness has to be a part of the conversation for any leadership team. So, yeah. Prioritizing our inner lives. Um, in a previous Workforce Wednesday, one of our one of our um, I think it was Nancy Lyons mentioned that uh, a lot of it is because us Gen Xers raised our kids with a sense of confidence and their voice is important and that sort of thing. And so they're prioritizing things that maybe we didn't prioritize in the past because we were taught to just kind of keep our mouth shut and keep our head down, stay in our lane, so to speak. Um, but that goes to a, a different idea, which is, again, these different priorities coming up from the uh, younger generations um, with regard to leadership. Um, I'm going to throw this one out to Philomena, if that's OK with you. Um, according to a Deloitte study, I'm just going to read it here. It's published in 2021. Forty nine percent of Gen Z take their personal values and ethics into account when choosing where to work. 
Um, do you think civic responsibility and community community accountability is important or valuable? Yeah, so I'll I'll do a history and then I'm going to go current. So I think about when I found looked for my first job after college. The equation was very simple for my parents. Find a job, buy a car and move out. I'm one of seven kids. <laughs> And I just think about how different it is for our three kids who are all in their 20s, right? Like, and also for applicants. So as people look at Land Lakes for employment, they're looking at not only what is the role that they're applying for, they're looking at what are the values of the organization? Tell me more about the culture. What's your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? What's your commitment to the community? And not only tell me, but show me. And that's a very different equation, uh, you know, than what we had had previously, because I think prior generations, like if you said, well, this is what we do, an applicant would be like, right, but show me, tell me. And even for our employees in our organization, it's the same. It's not only tell me what's happening, but how are we responding and what are we doing? And another change that's been really interesting, and I think organizations are really struggling with this now is, you know, typically in agriculture, Land O'Lakes would be right there taking stands on issues that impact egg and dairy, right? Uh, and being the voice. And now our employees are like, yeah, that's really good and that's super important, but what about some of these social justice, racial equity issues, right? Women's rights, different things that are happening. And so I think the really challenging part for us as organizations is figuring out what is our lane and how do we best do that? Wow. Was, is that difficult work? It is difficult work. Mm -hmm. It is and trying to maneuver, but I think the power, and that's what I think is so amazing about this organization. I also co-lead this Twin Cities DEI round table. I'm in an egg round table, a dairy one. <laughs> but why I say that is the importance of community. And we don't, there's not a history book that we can necessarily say, how do you respond to, right? I mean, there's lessons we can learn from history, but there things are happening at such an accelerated pace. And so I think that's the power of being together and talking about these things and learning and saying, I learned this today. How might this apply to my organization? I think that's the power. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Again, you know, we're talking about leadership. We're talking about employee engagement, um, bringing all these ideas together. Um, I have a, a more of an objective question for uh, Shanae. Um, we, when we talked last, you mentioned your organization, Lexington Manufacturing, has about 300 employees. And you have a quite robust leadership development system in your org, right? You have the Grow Program, you have the Rise Program, you have the Lead Program. All three of those would have been fun to talk about. I don't know if we're going to get time. But uh, how do you as an organization justify such robust leadership development programs in what many would consider to be just a mid-sized company? Yeah, great like, question. That, so, oh, yeah. Go ahead so, and answer, gonna have a, yeah. Essentially, like uh, we've heard, it's changing. We cannot continue to do what we've done. And, you know, we are manufacturing. We have to do it differently. And so when we talk about who is someone as a whole and what are they bringing into the door, they're not just running a machine and being happy. Like no one says like, that's all I want out of life. It's we want purpose and we want passion and we want engagement. And so it's we can do that at every level, but we have to ask what that means to them. So when I think about the three academies, yes, it's to hit different levels. Our grow is the first 90 days. We have our highest turnover in the first 90 days. So we have a very specific program for them. And then we have our rise, which is, you know, our middle level leaders and then our lead, which is managers and above. And not that they couldn't partake in all of it because, hey, if something meets you over here, we're going to let you, And if you're in grow, we're going to let you attend this different training. But it's really just expanding that machine operator one and machine operator two, they might do the same, but they're totally two different people and they're going to want different things. So I think that's the biggest thing is like, yes, as an organization, let's have a plan, but let's let's allow gray so we can meet you where you're at. So that way it's not this is how it is, because everyone wants their own plan. They want they want to jump around. They want to try something new. They want community involvement. 
And yeah. so that's our, all everything that we've grown into these programs. As, at what level do we kind of have a plan for you already? And if you want something further, you just got to ask and let us know. And then we're going to see how we can meet you right where you're at. That's wonderful. And that plays into what Jen was talking about with regard to, you know, we're all different. We're all coming from different cultural experiences from, you know, we, we are all, no matter what color, skin, gender, whatever, we're all thousands of intersections, right? That make us unique. Um, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that idea that it, you know, leadership has to be relatively form fit for the, for the organization and for the people. Um, I can't believe this, but we're almost out of time already. Uh, we, we left a lot of questions on the table. Um, and so what we always like to do at this point before going into the unplugged, and please remember at the unplugged, you can take yourself off mute and turn on your mic and have a conversation. Uh, we want to end with uh, each of you giving uh, one piece of advice or something to take away uh, as uh, audience members that we can maybe apply at our organization. So uh, Paula, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. So, um, when you asked this question earlier, one of the things I thought about is like how, and I think there was a chat question about this too, like how do you go about doing this? How do you equip your leaders with some of the, these tools? So when I think about that, there, there was three main skills that came to mind. One was teach them how to actively listen. What does that mean to actively listen? Teach them how to validate. So validation, I can't tell you how often I teach this skill because it's such a critical skill. And I often give the example of my, my teenagers and how well it works with them. And the other piece is empathy, like really teaching empathy and how do you do that? And one of the things that I often um, share as an example of how to do that is to, to think of that person as their five-year-old self, as a child. What was that person's essence as a child? And for whatever reason, sometimes that works or think of their pet. Like what is that feeling they have with a pet? Like how do they engage in with that pet and try to understand what that pet's needs are without communicating really, right? So um, teaching teaching your manager some of those skills would be my, um, at least one piece of advice. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, Jen, what would you tell our audience members? I would love for you to look at becoming an interrupter and disruptor. So when something happens that, you know, you feel that tapping in that Paula talks about, when you feel and know is uncomfortable, disrupt it, interrupt it, um, address. These are all skills to start learning. Listen. You know, silence is acquiescence for things to continue. I, I don't have to say missing and murdered Indigenous women. I'm wearing this to raise awareness and speak up. It can be that simple and that small. So every day is, is an opportunity to advocate, make change. You know, that retention relies on intentional, and deliberate action as either a formal leader or an informal leader. We all have that. Yeah, exactly. That relate, relates to like Philomena said about the little little pieces of good with the quote. Um, I just really, I really love that. Thank you so much. Uh, Shanae. Yeah, so um, for me, when we think about curiosity, the origin of curiosity is to care. So if we lean in and we ask more questions and we and we allow people to be who they are, show up who they are and respect that, but know, know who you are so you can let others be who they are and be really curious, ask more questions. And kind of like Paula said, you're going to see them as their five-year-old self. You're going to be less judgmental, less in a hurry to fix it. And then everyone can show up as who they are and you can appreciate all of the diversity that comes into that when you accept one, everyone for who they really are. So be curious and ask more questions. 
and that's something we can all do in whether we're leaders or not right which again it relates to what jen was saying too yes that we can all make a difference philomena last but not least all right. Well, my colleagues here have had so many. I've been taking notes too. <laughs> uh, all right. So a couple ideas. Uh, one, be the bridge. I just went to this powerful workshop on how to build bridges, right? Not walls. And I think that's the important part. Like on our team, some you know, a lot of times there's dissension. We have a polarized becoming more polarized in our society, right, left, you know, this, that, right? And so how do we be the bridge? And I love that point about curiosity. So like when I've gone to conferences and people are so excited to see me and they're like, well, what do you do, Philomena? I'm like, I lead our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. They're like, oh, and I'm like, what does O mean? Like, it's, a, <laughs> it's like a, they're, they're dissing me, but I'm curious, like, tell me more about that. Um, two, I'm going to say, uh, give grace to others and give grace to yourself, right? So we continue learning on this journey of life as leaders. Uh, there's many missteps along the way, hard knock learnings. But I think if we can do that, I think that's powerful. And then know your superpowers. Like that, I think, is the beauty of becoming an experienced employee. <laughs> I know what I'm good at. We just had a big meeting with our executive team for DEI yesterday and called in our data and analytics person. I'm like, Stephen, you are the, you have this superpower. I do not. Can you walk our leaders through, but know what we're good at and then know the talents of others and call them in and be like, hey, Paula, we want to hear from you. Tell us more about that. Um, so I think that, and then lastly, whose voice is not being heard in your organization, right? Yeah. On a call, it might be small, it might be in a meeting, it might be, you know, organization wide, we need to better understand what's going on with these employees and we need to elevate that voice and remove those barriers that may be getting in the way. So I got many, but those are a few. <laughs> oh, they're great. I mean, I, this is a conversation that we're just cracking, right? I had a list of questions here. We only got to about half of them, but there's going to be opportunity to have those questions uh, asked and responded to during our unplug session, which will be starting in a few minutes and hosted by Shayla. Um, but at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Shayla. Thank you all panelists for participating, being part of this. This was so amazing. Um, I'm going to turn the, the microphone over to Shayla, who's got a special announcement. Um, and then we'll let Della uh, close up the first hour session and we'll move into our unplugged. So, Shayla, would you like to take over? Yes. Uh, do you still have the slides up or do I need to? Yep. I can do it. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. People should know not to give me the keys to the technology by now. Perfect. So just a quick for anyone that is a and basically within the home community or facility based care. If you are in that industry, there is a caring careers campaign right now. So we're going to pop a link um, in the chat for the caring careers resources. There's tons of resources that are there available. This campaign is a collaboration with DHS and industry partners. So there's going to be a lot of activity through the months of June, July, and August. And um, next slide, we invite you all June for July 13th. There will be Oops. a WebEx for um, employers as well. So I forgot to mention that. Um, sorry, there's only one slide. So we'll hand that off now to Della. Hey everyone, I'm Della Ludwig. I'm the Workforce Strategy Consultant for Central Minnesota. Join us next month on July 5th, the day after the fireworks. Uh, Workforce Wednesday's topic will be growing and expanding your business. So join us for an engaging discussion to learn about strategies for growing and expanding your business uh, through the introduction of DEED's economic development team and the expansion and training grants available um, to your organization. So whether you're hiring three or more employees, looking at training employees on new equipment, or just expanding your physical business, DEED has many different funding opportunities available for you. So we'll be discussing that. And then we can go on to the next slide. 
And then um, I'd also like to thank our panelists for uh, leading the presentation today on uh, culture of leadership as a tool for retention. It was very educational and make sure you stay tuned. Um, we'll now be turning it back over to Shayla for the unplug session where we will turn off the recording, unmute our mics and turn on our cameras so we can have an open conversation uh, directly with you. So please give us a quick minute uh, for us to make this uh, quick transition and allow you to turn on your mics and cameras. Again, thank you. All right. And I will shut that recording off. Perfect. And